for because we have so many uh, new ones in here, I, I can share this story, and I think you relate to it very well, and some of you older ones will too. Uh, you know, there's nothing more uh, disheartening than to have somebody that uh, comes in your office, gives you a call, etc., and asks you a question, and that you just actually have no resources to go to find out an answer, uh, or you're, you're kind of in a quandary as to where to go. Well. To me, this was one of those areas. Uh, you know, we have a you know game ranger. You, you know, in every area you have all these wildlife people. But I don't deal with you know the little old lady skunks that are in her backyard, or the possum that's digging a hole uh, in her flower flower bed, or the squirrel that's you know doing damage. Those are things that I call kind of fall between the cracks, and they really do. So I want to give you just an idea today of some things that you might look at for resources in, in that particular area. Uh, you're going to find that I'm going to show you a number of resources here from a number of different states, none of which are from OSU, and I do this on purpose because Dwayne does have a DVD uh, that actually is pretty good. <laughs> this particular one, as you can tell, and it's the one I, we made a copy of and sent around because uh, I don't know if we're going to need everything in this particular uh, presentation, but it was done by uh, Charlie Lee at K-State. And uh, normally our, our colleagues in other states that are in extension, they don't mind if we use their presentations at all because we're all in this together. Now, obviously, if you're going to go out and use private industry PowerPoints, probably going to be some copyright issues and things along that line, but uh, and plus you've all got to worry about the content. But we can generally feel, you know, fairly safe. Uh, you need, obviously need to review your information, but make sure it's uh, pertinent to, to Oklahoma. But we can use some parts of Charlie's presentation, and he doesn't care, okay? So it, it's it's kind of one of those deals, uh, being a neighboring state extension, uh, I think it's good stuff. All right. Uh, you know, one of the things, four principles of wildlife damage management, and, and he kind of simplifies this, I guess, to some degree. What's the damage patterns? Uh, you got to figure out, it's kind of like identifying a weed. Uh, Brian will tell you, you know, there's certain things you got to look for, what band is it in, you know, what's the leaf formation, et, et cetera, et cetera. So you got to deal here with wildlife damage. If you got a mystery working uh, out there in a person's uh, landscape or, or, or terrain, uh, you know, and this could even go even agriculturally to livestock damage, maybe something's killing livestock. Uh, same kind of principles uh, apply there. You got to know what the damage patterns are. Figure out what to deal with. Then once you do, you got to think about what the biology is of that individual. In other words, you got to how are we going to attack this problem? You know, if uh, if it's uh, uh, you know agriculturally, if it's a mountain lion, you know, or a big cat uh, type deal, uh, we know enough about big cats. We know that yeah, you know, they may have done damage there. They may have actually killed a calf, but uh, knowing them, they're probably going to be miles down the road. Uh, by the time you can figure out what it is because they have a very large territory uh, versus you know agriculturally if it's a coyote uh, then you know may certainly be more local same thing in the yard if there's something digging a hole uh, in the yard well first of all you gotta think what would dig a hole obviously they're looking for food right uh, so what kind of wildlife test would be looking for food there in in uh, the soil area or the soil zone then once we do that we can look at some alternatives all right, first of all, before I go any further, there's a book that uh, and I fully intended on, on trying to find one to bring it with me. I gauge you probably still got this in uh, the county office up there. Hopefully all the rest of you do too. Uh, it's called Prevention and Control of Wildlife Damage. Uh, the current one is blue, and I think there's two different books. Has everybody got one in their office? Does anybody know what I'm talking about, some of you young ones? <laughs> uh, should be a three-ring binder. Should be blue in color. I, uh, you can actually go to wildlife damage at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln.edu, this website right here. And if you don't have one, you can print off an order form and order one. And I would highly, highly recommend that you do that. Uh, the old one was maroon in color, one singular book. The new one, new edition, there's two, 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 two of them. Uh, one's a little bigger than the other one, but uh, they expanded that, of course, we expect and updated it. The Nebraska, uh, University of Nebraska still coordinates this to this day. 
not all that information in there is theirs, but uh, they bring information together from a number of different land grant universities and uh, uh, print that. And I'll actually show you some copies of it, hopefully here. All right. Um, on a big scale basis, you know, uh, we look at agriculturally, uh, you know, reduce the population size. We've talked a lot about that. We'll visit here in a minute about deer. Uh, boy, right now it's pretty timely. It's deer season. Uh, basically, that's what's happening. Is, is trying to, uh, from a wildlife conservation standpoint, trying to reduce the population. That's why we have deer uh, hunting seasons. Uh, or maybe if it's something we can alter the animal's behavior. Uh, show you some examples of that very one here in a minute with deer, but maybe we can uh, take care of that. Mechanically, surgical, uh, you know, contraception, you know, all those areas. Uh, I will tell you, are probably not real practical for most. Uh, particularly back to our wildlife control. Um, or maybe it's going to come into translocation. Maybe we're going to need to move the wildlife. Uh, this is an example we get into if there's a, uh, if you're brave enough to trap the skunk that's causing the problem, uh, then people will, of course, translocate or relocate the skunk. Same thing with the raccoon, same thing with a possum or an armadillo. Uh, that may be the easiest thing in a lot of cases is to put them in a live trap not you, but the homeowner or a person put them in a live trap and relocate them to uh, someplace else. And uh, you know, that's, that's kind of got to be humorous over the years because I actually, uh, when I was in Washington County, we had, uh, had people that uh, all of a sudden started getting these pest problems. And come find out we had, uh, there were other people that were translocating the pest to their yard. And uh, there's obviously were not real well liked in the neighborhood, so everybody gave them their, uh, their armadillos. And I think so. All right. Let's talk about deer real quickly. Like I said, I want to skim through this because uh, I want to show you some other PowerPoints you might could use as well. Uh, deer are becoming a major, major problem uh, in, in most all of our towns. Uh, you know, uh, Kenda, and I, I'm sure in Tulsa now, we probably have several generations of deer that have never seen the the outside of the Tulsa city limit area. In other words, the old uh, we used to talk about uh, using smells, using sounds to scare off deer. Well, if deer grew up in the middle of Tulsa, people's scent is not unusual to them. Sounds are not unusual to them. Horns are not unusual to them. Sirens are not unusual to them. I would imagine it's still water. We probably have several generations of deer in some areas there that uh, have never seen the country. However, in some of our areas, uh, we still can uh, at least hope that the deer are not there on a permanent basis and they just come through to eat landscape or cause damage to uh, trees. Uh, here's a, of course, one, they just like goats. They, as we all know, they have a browse line. The size they can reach is what they're gonna, what they're gonna go after. And uh, certainly they are browsers, so they do like woody, woody plants. Here's one thing about deer, and every time I, I use this uh, to do presentations, this always shocked a lot of our urban people. Everybody see what that is? Ticks. They are considered to be a major vector and, and transporter of ticks, in particular in our urban areas. Yeah, I always had people talking about the fact that uh, they couldn't figure out why they had why they had such a huge tick pop problem and, and so on and so forth, and they were right in the middle of town. Well, more than likely, probably some form of wildlife or birds or something has brought the ticks in there. You know, it just aggravates uh, folks in the city to death because they're, they're treating their lawns every year uh, for ticks and do a nice job with it, and then they continue to have ticks, of course, which then gets on their pets, which then they go to the local veterinarian Barry, and, and uh, of course, we can do a nice job of trying to educate our public with our our uh, local vets, uh, to try to help people with that uh, with that issue. So deer, uh, birds, rabbits. There's some pictures here in the in the garden, and you know this is a real life scenario. You you may get calls if uh, something's eating my watermelons, something's eating my my vegetables in in the garden, wondering what it could be. And most of the time, they'll swear to God it's the neighbor or the neighbor's kid, and they don't even think about the fact that it could be some sort of wildlife uh, doing that damage. And of course, the insurance companies anymore, 
are uh, just absolutely just it, this is really causing them a major a major amount of uh, uh, financial hardship uh, because the I'll show you some stats here in a minute how much uh, wrecks have went up over the years that involved deer and uh, the only thing I will say folks I just got I've been gone for a week to Illinois to visit my oldest daughter and I will tell you the, only, the biggest difference with our deer here and there we both have deer theirs are probably about uh, 50 to 75 pounds bigger at least because uh, they get up there and they eat that corn and uh, it is absolutely unbelievable when you see a deer uh, like deer going through the windshield or causing damage like that here probably total a car up there I mean it's amazing what that extra weight uh, will do this is their corner bed but if you look at that this is just a 20 year period that, that he picked out to illustrate here my oh my that's the number of uh, accidents related to deer uh, if you're in the insurance business this kind of made you want to cringe with Uh, of course, we talk about, uh, you know, this is not real practical. Uh, you know, or you'll drive through the countryside and see a lot of fences like this, but it's normally probably keep things in, uh, like deer. It may be a tame deer uh, operation or something like that. Uh, it's normally not, not cost effective to use to keep them out, but uh, those are things that certainly are options. Uh, this guy here, uh, because they do a lot of damage to trees, uh, he's putting a, a, a netting up there. One of the things that we we uh, see a lot of, and as county agents, we're we always have to be aware of, is all the products that are out there. They're supposedly going to solve everybody's problems, and you know that's why one of the many reasons we're still so popular today to our public is we're not biased. You know, we don't have anything to sell, but uh, well, there's a lot of other people that do, and so you know, deer repellents are no different. Probably kind of hard for you to maybe even see on that sheet or see that see up there. But biggest problem we have with any kind of wildlife repellent uh, is how long it's going to last. You know, uh, y'all may even have uh, uh, spouse or family members that will use the, uh, or maybe y'all do yourself, use the dog and cat repellent. You know, in, in flower beds, keep your own dog or cat out. And one of the things that uh, run into is how often you have to do it. Well, these are basically uh, weeks down here, and as you can tell, uh, longer the time goes, uh, virtually all of them, you're getting more bites uh, or more damage uh, there on the plants. But uh, there's a few of them, actually, that held up pretty darn well all the way out to, uh, you know, 13 weeks. Uh, by deer, uh, plant skin, I mean, some of those, uh, they're just basically different types of, of scents that are supposed to ward them off. This one, everybody will recognize the, the turquoise with his coyote urine. It actually did pretty good out to probably to about two months. And uh, why is coyote urine effective? They're a predator. Yeah, they're a predator of deer. So there again, we have, to, we have to know for sure what we're dealing with. You know, you know. There's smaller trees that have some, some guards on them. Uh, there's a, this one, is, and we have a publication at Oklahoma State uh, on deer resistant plants. And uh, it's not a lot different than, than the ones that uh, K State put together here. Uh, some things there that you kind of would expect uh, a lot of the evergreens, a lot of the particular the junipers, uh, really not too affected by. Uh, my deer. You know, that's why eastern red cedars are not to, you know, favorite uh, food for, for deer out in native environment. But uh, you get over there, they say they're, they're actually on the list of rarely damaged there on the left side. Alright, here's the ones that are frequently <coughs> damaged. And uh, probably really shouldn't be a big surprise there either. A lot of fruit trees. Uh, they taste good, you know, to the deer. And uh, you know, if you'll see apples, plums, cherries, they're all on there. Uh, roses are on there. All right, now I want to tell you something real quickly. I didn't watch the time here because I want to show some other stuff. But I was there for a long time on the Kansas border, and I didn't think we had a major problem with Prairie Bowl. 
a matter of fact, I even said that one time in a public meeting, and darn it, that next year we did have a massive invasion of Prairie Bone. Uh, we do have them uh, in northeast Oklahoma, and I suspect y'all probably do in southeast Oklahoma quite a bit. Uh, I do think that all of our wildlife do go up and down in terms of population. There's a lot of things we would expect are related to the weather, food habitat, etc. But uh, this little critter, he is, he is here. So uh, and sometimes it's really difficult to, to see his damage. Uh, may dig around, uh, dig around plants. I think I've got one here. Yeah, right there. Particularly dig around ceilings. And this, yeah, that's kind of tough trying to figure out that that's a prairie bow doing that because there's a lot of things they could knock that uh, young corn plant over there but uh, you know just kind of part of the mystery Jeff saw here's what we typically get into that's more of a typical prairie bowl type of damage site in uh, turf you know if you went out there uh, and looked at that particular area there's probably a lot of things across your mind uh, you know as what who's doing the damage but probably the giveaway is the fact that it's got you know some the trench areas or, or runs there look more like a mole or something like that. Look at those holes. Uh, you can tell it's probably some sort of small rodent like prairie bell is going to get out of there. There's a closer version there. Uh, I've had some uh, folks who bring me pictures and things like that in, and, and uh, I like to tell them that view right there is a rodent. They can't, uh, can't really tell much more than that, but it is a rodent. Uh, it could be, a, you know, mice or rats or prairie bow. Uh, you know, uh, Walter, your predecessor's predecessor, Roy Ball, he made a comment one time, and I thought it was just so hilarious. His, com his, uh, his answer uh, to most of the rodent, small rodent uh, issues out there in lawns, you remember what it was, Stan? Rat terrier. <laughs> and he used to tell everybody that uh, basically they need to buy a rat terrier. And lo and behold, a lot of people did go buy rat terriers right there around the Bonita and Craig County area. So it's uh, interesting what you remember about that. But, but uh, that would be undoubtedly a predator for a prairie bow. Okay, I use that as an example. Uh, probably about the only kind of predator that you can actually control uh, in, in a lot of the road situations. Toxicants, we'll talk about that here uh, in just a second, a little more in depth. We have to be care about, careful about toxicants that you use on prairie bow because uh, dog or cat in the area then might come and eat the prairie bow that had ingested the uh, toxin. Repellents, not many repellents. Alternative feeding, probably not real effective either. So those are just kind of some standard things. House mouse, yeah, lo and behold, if you stay in a county office long enough, you will get questions on rodents in the house. Now, how far do you want to go with that? Probably depends on your clientele and what the expectations are in your county. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't try to make myself known as a, as a mouse specialist, but uh, if somebody came in, I would try to answer their questions. But uh, I think we probably know what a house mouse looks like. There's a closer version. Here's a deer mouse. Uh, yeah, he's got a he's got a wide underline, and uh, yeah, you'll see some similar to that in pet stores. All right, now this one this is 04. I wouldn't dare try to use this as current. Okay, uh, there are a few of them that are actually on the market right now. Uh, virtually most all of them, I think, in that top three. I think all of those are. Uh, biggest thing is with most of these, uh, if you go to Lowe's, Atwood's, Tractor Supply, wherever, and you start looking at some of these, most all of them anymore probably are going to fit probably in those, those top two. Uh, and the reason, and <clears throat> Barry, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think most of those have kind of a slow effect of killing the, the mouse or the rat. So it's not supposed to stink as bad. In other words, it, uh, it's not a quick kill. If you do a quick kill and you've got uh, uh, a lot of blood and tissue there, it's going to rot and they get kind of stinky. But uh, with those, they kind of have a slow effect uh, in, in killing the rodent. And if you've ever killed a, a rat or a mouse in your house, 
with the other kind and it happened to get in a cabinet or something you couldn't find it it gets really stinky and so you can see why some of those might come into the play as being a little more popular but here's the problem that uh, events around the state uh, will tell you this all the time there's no telling how many dogs and cats they see that have, have gotten into to rodents that have ate some of these toxins and so make sure that uh, you keep them where keep it in a bait station or something that you uh, not right around your dogs and cats because they a lot of them the smellier they are the better they like them and so uh, all right birds I'm going to breeze through this real fast uh, but I will just tell you that there's a lot of things we get into people with barns people with uh, uh, back patios etc uh, what in the world are you going to do with, with a, uh, with a uh, bird population? I'll show you some pictures of you see them too, the big balloons. They're yellow, have a big eyeball on them. It's supposed to make it look like it's a predator. Uh, there are some of them that uh, will have uh, uh, noises, uh, whistle bombs. Uh, you know, of course, you get into cropland areas like over your way, Jeff, uh, where you get to the massive amounts of blackbirds that come in there and you have to put the uh, can floaters out. A lot of those have to have a, you have to have a uh, license or permission from the wildlife department to use. Uh, at least legally. Uh, not most ordinances in towns won't let you use them. Maybe you can use netting. Uh, netting is kind of an interesting thing because netting works really well uh, with uh, small fruits like grapes, uh, strawberries, uh, things along that line. You may have to use it because birds can really do a lot of damage to you. Now that bottom one down there is kind of interesting because a guy in California a number of years ago figured out that uh, the grape flavoring agent uh, that they put like in, in Kool-Aid and things like that, that it was a, a repellent for most kinds of birds and it caused a real ir irritating uh, feeling to them or irritable feeling, burning sensation. Uh, I don't know if it worked or not, but you know uh, people are desperate. Uh, I tell them, you know, if you tried everything else, this is not research proven, but uh, go get you some great Kool-Aid and, and uh, spray it out there on your birds. You know, sometimes it just made them feel good. And, you know, you feel like you're helping. I don't know. We still, I, I'm really kind of disappointed. There's still not a lot of research evidence. There's, there is some that indicates that it works, but I think there's just not a lot of research out there on, on that. Big difference is though, and uh, Gus, don't go out there and tell them you use the grape Kool-Aid that has sugar in it. Because uh, I had some deal with that and they had a massive ant population. So uh, they got rid of their birds, but they, they got, uh, got ants in the process. Alright, pigeons. A lot of towns have problems with pigeons. Like crap on everything. Here's that balloon that I was talking about. There's all kinds of deals. Uh, there's, this is just one of the balloons. They call them scare, scare balloons, scare eye balloons. Um, this one is kind of interesting. Works uh, pretty well for roosting birds, pigeons. Uh, it's basically just a strips of wire put out. That basically, all it does is when they, when they roost on something on a ledge, it pokes them. Okay, and and they can't actually sit there. Um, we get a lot of. Uh, Scare devices, uh, you know, they're being promoted out there, but uh, uh, basically, like I said, owls would be a predator. If you wonder why plastic owl is on there, it's a predator to most different kinds of birds. All right, let's, uh, I'm going to change gears here real fast. Oh, wait a minute. I like this picture here. Uh, you know, raccoons, uh, one of the biggest problems we have with raccoons is because they come out and eat cat and dog food. So, just change where you put your cat and dog food. Okay, it might solve your problem. Or you can have a big problem. I like that picture there. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That's an adventure. That's it. Okay, I'm going to change gears here and show you just real quickly. I'm about to run out of time. Yeah. Okay. Hey, just uh, real quick, I want to show you this because Wisconsin, this, this particular presentation is probably not one of the better ones. 
Wisconsin has a uh, every one of their PowerPoints that's used in Master Gardener programs, they have them online. And, and they they will give you permission to use them. And I have used a bunch of them over the years. Now obviously, there's going to be a lot of differences between Wisconsin and Oklahoma uh, in terms of obviously, you know, the average last day of frost and, and those kind of deals. But they have, uh, get over to it, it? they have some excellent, excellent uh, programs. First part of this is all feeding birds, which, there we go. Here's the part that, uh, if you look at that right there, somebody brought in a picture. This is a, a pretty typical deal. Uh, what you think right off the bat, that's birds? Yes, it's probably a woodpecker. Uh, could be uh, on a tree, it could be a yellow bellied sapso. And uh, people are all the time are wanting to uh, kill them. And uh, well, most of the time they're protected. Uh, most all areas. There's another balloon, though, that's one I wanted to show you here. That one is probably more like what we see in our part of the country. We got both of them here on the station. Do you? Right there. They're, uh, you know, I, I will tell you a funny story, though, about these balloons. Uh, they tell you on the package and all the research evidence in case they stoop, you need to move them from time to time. And uh, I can have personal proof that you need to move them because when you walk into your barn and the birds are sitting on top of this crapping on it, it's time to move the balloon. I think they figured out it's no longer a predator anymore. So uh, there's, yeah, always read that. Uh, one more I want to show you here real quickly before. And all these are online, folks. These are not, uh, I'm just showing you some of the ones that I've used. There's, there's a bunch more out there. That obviously wasn't the right one. Ah, there we go. Anybody know where Rutgers is? New Jersey. That is the extension server. That's Land Grant University in New Jersey. Uh, now there's uh, quite a lot here that's probably not going to be real applicable for us, but uh, there are some that's really good. Their, their deer section is good. Uh, take out any parts of this and use it. Uh, one in here though that's really different. Yeah, up here, that's funny. Frightening device, a dog. Uh, hey, it works. Works very well. Uh, different purpose than Roy's rat terriers work, but you know, certainly uh, very, very helpful. Uh, somewhere here is a different one, though. Ah, yes, rabbits. The rabbits, of course, are big for gardeners, and uh, you know, rabbits eat a lot of a lot of vegetation. Uh, Brian talks to you about the fact that only half your forage is actually available out there, or sometimes half of half, depending on some native environments. Uh, one of the th one of the uh, little beasts that it does eat a lot of that forage out there, so the cattle, goats, sheep, or horses, or nothing else can is rabbits. They eat a lot of, eat a lot of forage, and, and other types of All right, but this is kind of interesting here because I, I don't know if you see it. Uh, we'll see in. Uh, we don't get a lot of snow in Oklahoma, but we get one of those winters where uh, snow cover for a long time, uh, you may get questions about plants that are being girdled there at the base. Uh, some, somebody's chewing the bark off of it. Uh, could be a lot of different ones, but if it's down at the base, you think about, okay, how tall is a rabbit? This is obviously not deer damage, is it? Uh, deer that get down on their, on their belly in order to get down that low. If you look, this is a snow line. Um, that's on the ground. Well, probably a rat. Uh, it's one one obvious way to look at it. If you're wondering what this right over here is, that's the droppings from a rat. Another good way, you know, kind of figure out whether it's a rat doing that. Because the snow cover, you're probably going to uh, <coughs> probably going to be able to uh, see some droppings out here. Uh, tree guards. These little guys will do a lot of damage. Uh, I mentioned this today, not just for uh, uh, randomness, but uh, the fact this was a big, big rabbit ear. 
Everybody you talk to statewide in the wildlife area will tell you that the rabbit population probably is larger this year than they've seen in a long time. Anybody notice that when he's going down the highway? Yeah, a lot of rabbits. Uh, and it wasn't just here, there's was a lot of them even uh, on, out west too. So uh, if there's that many rabbits in the summertime, probably going to be a lot of rabbits in the wintertime, obviously. So uh, there might be some reasons there to look at that. Uh, squirrels. Okay, so last one I'll end on before I get too far over time here. We get lots and lots of questions about squirrels. Uh, you know, some, Doug, we can't do a lot about. Your pecan producers uh, consider this public enemy number one because they do eat a lot of, a lot of pecans. Uh, but uh, they get in houses too. And there's nothing more aggravating than a, than a squirrel in the attic of a house or in the wall of a house. Keeps you awake all night long. You know, it's not a good situation. So, uh, you know, we have to think about, uh, okay, what, uh, maybe, what is their ecology? Uh, which they're probably there in the house. If they are in the house, that's probably in order to reproduce, uh, probably come in and, and nest for the winter. Uh, for outside, you know, we can do, you know, some neat things. We put metal collars around trees, because they also will wilt on the trees. Uh, quite quite a lot. Uh, if we're going to do that though, we'll probably need to put it all the way up, uh, six foot off the ground, because these little guys can't jump. Uh, they can jump pretty well. Uh, a lot of people have done this, particularly in urban areas, uh, you know, housing addition where they travel not from tree to tree to tree to get uh, down the, the block, but then they also can travel on top of electric wires uh, or, or cabling coming into a house. Uh, they can actually put PVC pipe on it. And uh, I've been told it's pretty entertaining uh, to watch them try to kind of do that on top of the PVC pack on the, on the wire. Haven't ever done that, but uh, if you're going to try to exclude them from a facility and we're trying to advise a homeowner of this, uh, they keep putting the board back over the area that they're digging through or, or clawing through on the house. Guess what? It's not going to do any good. They got to put metal on it. It's the only thing they can't chew through. So if you put metal screening or something there. Uh, it's more like the squirrel is chewing around uh, uh, an er entry area, like uh, where pipes or cables or something come into the house. They start there and chew a hole in it. Uh, repellents. Uh, that book I talked about will give you a lot of these ideas uh, for repellents, but uh, for squirrels, mothballs, uh, which are really a pretty good repellent for a lot of things. We just have to be careful when using ball balls because environmentally may not be something you want to use around plants or even around animals or pets in the house. Uh, there are some, some repellents on the market. Uh, here's Rotel, uh, capsaicin, the hot sauce, you know, types of things. Uh, it'll work pretty well for them as well. Uh, moles, of course, a big one. I'm running out of time, so he quit. Uh, but Moles typically, bottom line, we just try to eliminate the food source or, or trap them. Uh, it's probably going to be there's the traps there. There's a lot we could talk about. We can you know, come back at some other time uh, in the spring or whatever and talk about it in more detail, but I probably should not eat into any more of my time here. Um, Brian, you want to give him a break? Or? Uh, yeah, we can do a short. Let's do a short five minute break. Five minutes. Or then you're going to be eating in Brian's time. Thank you.